back to episode four of my podcast, The Afterthought Knits. My name is Thalia and I am joining you to chat today from Calgary in Canada. And this is basically where I talk about what I've been knitting lately, what I've been sewing lately, and generally catch up with what you've been knitting and sewing lately. Um, really excited to be here. It's been a lovely couple of weeks since I last talked to you. Uh, my parents came and visited. It was really great to see them uh, and just generally been chugging along. It's been getting a little bit colder here in the mornings and evenings and we had our first real snow, which was exciting. Uh, and we went up north to Jasper for a few days. We saw 12 moose, which is pretty cool. I've never seen that many moose in one spot all together before. Um, and yeah, just generally really nice to get outside and enjoy the nature that we have so close to us for a little while. Uh, On to the knitting aspect. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you about what I'm wearing today. This is my first ever sweater. It is by Talia Steinman. Oh my god, that's wrong. It's by Thelma Steinman, um, and it's style number 162, I believe, but I'll put the details up because I can never remember the numbers. Um, in any case, I've been referring it to it as my fire sweater for obvious reasons. And I am so, so thrilled with it. This was my first time making a sweater uh, and my first time doing color work. So altogether feeling pretty excited about my progress in this project. Uh, I knit this in Gathering Yarns Heathers in two colors. I've got this nice teal and this gold that has kind of red flecks in it. Um, try and do a little zoom in and if it doesn't work very well, I'll just cut out and put a picture in. So that's the yarn. Um, I have been wearing this a bunch lately and I'm really, really happy with it. The yarn is not too scratchy or anything like that. It definitely softened up a lot after I blocked it. Um, for those of you who are newer, like I am, uh, blocking is basically where you dunk your whole knit in a bucket of water for a little while, let it get all soaked up and help the fibers kind of relax into a new shape and then take it out and dry it in whatever shape you want your finished object to be. Uh, and so I used that to kind of even out some of the stitches, especially in my transition from the non-color work portion to the color work portions. In terms of difficulty of this sweater, I didn't think it was too hard, um, especially because it is mostly all knit in one color. So it's a pretty basic sweater pattern, but then you have the little bit of color work on the sleeves to kind of liven things up. And the color work chart that you use is not super, super long. So if you just wanted a taste of color work, um, I'd recommend it. This is knit on size three and a half millimeter needles, which did make it quite a lot of stitches, but I'm really happy with the way that the fabric turned out. It's quite drapey. Uh, for my next sweater, I think I will change a couple things. For one, this sweater is a raglan style sweater, um, as you can see here, and it does not have any short row shaping. So when I picked this sweater, I didn't really know what short row shaping is, but basically, and this is my current understanding of it, feel free to correct me if you have a better explanation for it. But if you think of a ready to wear sweater, typically the back is a little bit longer than the front is. And that's when you hold up a shirt and you can see part of the back through the front neckline. And so that makes the neckline drop forward when you've got some extra fabric in the back and makes it more round. This one, uh, does not have that. So it's all the same front and back. There's no directionality to it. And so that means that I find the neckline sits a little bit higher on the front of my neck and a little bit lower in the back. And if I do kind of pull it forward, um, you can start to get kind of a, 
this little like pouch almost that forms right at the base of the neck. It looks kind of like that. And if you look through pictures of patterns and like sweaters online, you'll see that a lot of them have this kind of bagginess in the transition from the neck to the body. Uh, and my understanding currently is that that means that you did not add enough shaping to the back to make it kind of drop forward and level that out in the front. So for my next sweater, I'll show you the yarn that I picked out for it at the end, um, but I believe it does have the short row shaping, um, so I'm excited to give that a shot. I have two other finished objects that I've uh, wrapped up since the last time we were here together. Uh, the first one is one that I told you that I was almost done last time and I finished them I think the day after I filmed my last podcast episode and that is this pair of socks. Here, there's two of them. They are in fact a pair. Um, these are a pretty simple basic sock. I used Summerly Knits um, SOS basic sock pattern, school of sock, SOS school of sock. Um, her basic sock pattern um, and made these for my partner. Um, this is done in kind of super normal superwash merino, 25% nylon uh, that was dyed by a local dyeing company for one of the local yarn stores and it's called Stashing Through the Snow, um, which is a fun name and you can kind of see it's got this blue gray with pops of bright red um, and it is nice and wintry and it was I got it on sale over the summer from their last winter collection and I luckily finished it up right in time for the new snow so that was fitting I thought and I'm excited for my partner to get these onto his feet and start buying them I have not let him yet because I wanted to show them to you before they got all uh footy yeah the other thing that I finished up was um, my Pearl Soho kitchen dishcloth that I've been working on. Um, this is one of their slip stitch dishcloths. They have a set of three free patterns that give you different color combination dishcloths. Uh, and this whole pattern of these two colors is made using a series of slip stitches. So instead of having color work where you're working with two different colors of yarn at a time in a single row. With this, you only ever work with a single color of yarn at the same time. You go across, you come back, and then you switch to the other colors. So if you wanted to uh, have something that had a little bit of color to it, but you didn't feel like color work was where you wanted to dive in right away, I would highly recommend trying something that does use this slip stitch knitting because it was really straightforward. Um, it's done almost entirely in knit stitch. You don't purl, you just knit and slip and it gives you this lovely pattern. Uh, they've also got one that gives you a kind of checkered pattern. And so I think that with my next set of colors, I will cast on with that. And I did a little I-cord loop at the end so that we can hang it off of a hook um, or anything like that. And that's just gonna go onto our stove. Uh, I did notice kind of actually as I was editing my last episode that I have made one mistake in it, uh, which is right smack in the middle right here. I forgot to slip my stitches and instead I knit through them. And so there's one spot where the blue line doesn't continue all the way through. But once I realized I was already basically like close to where I thought I was gonna finish it, and I didn't really feel like ripping back because it was just a dishcloth. And that is where you let your perfectionism go a little bit because you're using it to like wipe up spills. So it can handle having one little mistake in it and I can handle it having one little mistake. But I think this would make a really cool kind of stitch for a sweater or a shirt or something in like two maybe tonal colors. I think it would be really neat and someone should do it. <laughs> I'm sure it already exists, I just haven't seen it. So these are my three finished objects. I'm, 
I like basically devoted most of the time to finishing up the second sleeve of this one. I got stuck. I got a little bit intimidated by the concept of redoing the color work, despite the fact that the first arm had gone totally fine. I just felt like it was going to be a lot of thinking and then I got into it and it really was not as bad as I had built it up to be in my head, which I think is probably uh, true for many things in life. Um, but uh, once I'd finished this, I felt like most of the things that I was working on were ready to become finished objects, except for my socks. I'll show you my socks. These are the same socks that you've seen before. I have my green ruffle sock, and I also have a blue and red sock that's a little bit further away right now, and I'm gonna leave over there. I've gotten this far into the heel of my red and blue sock, so I'm gonna work on that on my way to work today, uh, and I think I can get through the heel, and then I'll be well into the way of the body. And I have my green ruffle sock where I'm just folding over because I wanted the ruffle to point down instead of pointing up. And I, turns out, do not really like stitching my live stitches into the stitches that I've already made. But I know that part of that is me just not helping myself out because I could make this a lot easier for myself if I were to pick up all of the stitches that I need to stitch into with an afterthought lifeline. And so I think that that's what I'm going to do so that I uh, actually get through this combining portion and can wear these in the near future. I'm just going to go in and pick up the stitches that I want to uh, be adding on. So instead of picking it up with the tip of my needle like that and then knitting the two together, I'm going to pick them all up on a thread and then as I get to them, they're already kind of in a more active V state and easier to pick up and I don't have to think as much in every single stitch. And then I just get to knit down for like an inch or so before I do my heel and then that one is really smooth sailing. So these are what I'm going to be taking to work in the next little while just to give me something to do during lunchtime. Um, yeah. Okay, so things you've already seen, all done. Now on to the new things. Um, I have two new works in progress that I'm really excited about both of them. The first one I have here in my zero waste wave bag that I've been kind of using as a knitting bag to take with me if I'm going somewhere that has a lot of sitting or I'm going on the bus. I've been taking this either on its own or in another bag and it has been storing what is the beginning of an Oslo hat. Um, so there we go. It's got this beautiful pink and kind of purple burgundy yarn. This is the Oslo hat by Petite Knit. Uh, I've made three of them already. This is going to be my fourth. And this one is going to be a gift for my partner's parents who are going to come stay with us over Christmas this year. So I'm knitting this a little bit differently than the pattern calls for. I'm using three strands of yarn. So the pattern originally calls for two strands of fingering yarn held together. And that gives you the correct gauge to move forward and it makes it nice and squishy. Uh, I saw at my local yarn store, this lovely um, Brooklyn Tweed Veil. It's an American Rambouillet wool. Um, and it is lace weight, but I really, really liked the color. And it was also, I think 30% off because they've discontinued that weight. So I bought it thinking that maybe two strands of lace weight would be all right. And then I thought had an even better thought, which was I bet if I add in a strand of Merino, three strands of lace weight might be close-ish to two strands of fingering. Uh, and there's yarn weight calculators that you can do online, um, but they're a little bit confusing. And what I did instead was I swatched it as one should. So I just took all three um, together. Uh, this one is a drops kid silk in a color that I'll put up on the screen because I cannot remember off the top of my head, but it's a really nice kind of 
plummy, jammy pink. Not quite as bright pink as some of the other ones, but it's adding a really nice uh, color to the hat overall. So I swatched them and I ended up right on gauge with my three and a half millimeter needles and these yarns. And so I've knit about six inches for the brim, I believe, and then I've attached the brim and now I'm on to the head portion. <laughs> and it's going along great and I can't wait to finish it up and give it to her. I think she's gonna really like it. Um, they've been out buying winter clothes for their visit because it gets quite a bit colder here in Calgary than it does in Scotland. So gotta make sure that they're nice and cozy so that they come visit us again. <laughs> in my other work in progress, this one is a bit of a project. Uh, so you, I am sure, if you watch any other knitting podcasts, are familiar with the Pearl Soho half and half triangles wrap. It is essentially like a big square that's the size of a baby blanket. Um, and it's on their website and their recommended yarn for it is something called Linen Twill. And it's this really nice blend of linen and wool. And then when they dye it, I learned this in my first episode from some of the lovely commenters. So when you dye wool, there's specific types of dyes that stick to different types of material. So there's protein dyes that stick to things that are like wool, hair, silk, um, and sometimes nylon, weirdly, but those are typically for things that have come from an animal. And there are plant dyes that stick to things that come from plants. And so if you use this kind of dye, you get the wool to be whatever color you dye it, and then your plant material will stay in its original color. And so it gives this really cool, like speckled look um, that's a little bit different from something that say, variegated where it's tonally different or even something that's two different colors that have been spun together. So like I have with my hat here, I've got my merino or my mohair that's kind of adding a little bit of extra color. It's almost like that, except it's combined in with the yarn and I think it looks really, really cool. Um, that being said, I live in Canada and I resent paying duties <laughs> when I buy things. So I rarely buy things online from America. And in particular, I don't love buying things that go on my body online because I worry about fit and I worry about how it will feel. And everybody's been raving about the Pearl Soho Linen Twill, so I'm sure it would be fine, but it's a significant investment just in the off chance that I personally did not like it. Anyways, this is a long lead up to say that I went to Stash Lounge, which is the yarn store or one of the yarn stores here in Calgary, and they stock a section for dyeing. So they have undyed prepped for dye yarns and they have a selection of jacquard acid dyes. And so you can dye your own yarn in whatever color you would like. And so I was just kind of browsing, I was looking for the yarn for this hat. And while I was there, I saw that they had this Gathering Yarn Homestead. Um, so Gathering Yarn is a wholesale yarn company here in Canada. You can't buy directly from them, but they are stocked in quite a few places. So you can check out their website and it'll tell you who their stockists are. Or if you are a dyer, perhaps you can um, order directly from them with a wholesale account. And so this is their Homestead Sock Yarn. It's 80% wool and 20% hemp. And so I was thinking, I mean, hemp is a plant fiber. The linen is also a plant fiber. I wonder if I tried to dye this, if I would get something that looked similar to the way that the linen twill does. And I can feel this and I know that it's pretty soft. You know, I would be happy to wear this as like a blanket over a shirt for sure. So that was what I did. I got a thing of the jacquard acid dye. I'll run and grab it. 
So this is what my dye bottle looks like. Um, I got color 630, which is spruce, and it says that it will dye silk wool feathers and nylon. Uh, what I thought spruce would be was kind of like a deep green. Um, I really, really like the darker colors with the uh, plant fiber coming through. I thought it looked really, really cool. And so I embarked on a dyeing adventure. I soaked my yarn in a big pot with some wool um, and well, big pot with some water. The yarn is the wool water. Um, so that was a pre-soak treatment. And then I brought a big, like big kind of stock pot that I'd bought specifically for dyeing something else a little while back. Um, and so I brought that to a near boil, um, tossed in the enough of this dye powder that it said to do on the instructions. And then a little bit of vinegar because you use acid to set the dye. And then I unwrapped my skeins um, or hanks into the long tubey things that are held together in a couple points by some yarn. And I just dumped them all into the dye bath and let it be at like a just below a simmer for about half an hour. Uh, it said, I read a couple of different instruction manuals beforehand and I'll link below for the kind of beginner ones that I used if you're interested in trying to dye something like this yourself. Um, and some of them said that you should leave it until all of the dye color has bonded to your yarn and so the water is clear. That did not appear like it was going to happen anytime soon, so I just pulled them out and tried to let them cool and then rinse them out. Um, and I had moderate success. Uh, for things like that are darker colors, apparently you can get some running. And so I don't think I got totally to the point where no color was coming off of my yarn when I rinsed it. But I rinsed it a lot of times, probably like seven or eight times, and then I let it dry a little bit because I thought maybe drying would help set it. That was just me. That There's no real rationale for that. Um, and then I rinsed it some more and I washed it with some of the wool wash that I have. And then I let it dry for real. <laughs> So this is what I started with, which was the homestead in the undyed kind of natural color. And after drying it, it looked like this. Um, so it's kind of like a really dark teal and you can see the flecks of the hemp throughout. Um, and I'll give you a little zoom in. Hopefully that worked. Yeah, so nice little flecks of hemp, and it's just such a beautiful color. I love how dark it is, and I'm gonna, th I think, pair it with maybe a lavender color, but I thought I'll only dye half um, of the color to begin with, and then I will get to make sure that the first half of dyeing went well before I dye the second half. So I've been storing that one kind of un unwrapped so that I could show you um what it looked like and then I've got one that I just kind of twisted back up and so that's what it looks like all twisted together and then I cast on oops so I've cast on my half and half wrap and I've gotten about an inch and a half into it and so far so good it is like everyone has said the perfect just like sit and chill project uh you really don't have to think too hard while you're doing it, just keep on knitting through. And I've been doing the German short row method of short rows. Um, the way that the half and wrap, half wrap is constructed is you knit one triangle and you create the triangle by knitting all the way across and back. But then every time you get to one side, you stop and turn around one stitch sooner. So it's kind of like a staircase and that makes a nice big triangle. And so the way that the pattern explains to do that is with something called a wrap and turn short row. Um, and then when you pick up all of your stitches to put on the other color, you have to knit the wrap 
with the stitch that's on the needles. Um, and there's a lot of YouTube videos that will explain that better than I ever possibly could because I'm not sure I totally understand it. Um, in any case, I converted it to German short rows. So instead of using a wrap and turn, I'm using a short row or a German short row where you get a, you like transfer one stitch from one side to the other and then you pull the yarn to the back. And then that makes a kind of double stitch. So you can see there, there's two stitches together. That's actually one stitch. And so then when you go through again, you just knit all of your double stitches as if they were a single stitch. And as an added benefit, it means that I don't have to keep track of a stitch marker because I know where I'm turning because I'm turning at the last one that is not yet a double stitch. So that makes it nice and handy. Um, oops. I've got this on a nice big set of needles um, and I went for a nice long one so that I wouldn't have to be scrunching things up too badly. But I'm really excited about how it looks so far. It's like this beautiful mossy green and I can't wait to keep on knitting on it. I think this is gonna be a kind of longer term work in progress, but I'll keep you updated on how far I get. Uh, I decided to do a three stitch I-cord edging on the side um, to kind of just keep things looking nice and tidy and so far so good. And yeah, I just really can't wait to see how it turns out. I have one other, oh, sewing. I'm gonna show you what I've been sewing lately because I'm really excited about what I'm sewing next. And I'll just run and grab them really quickly. And then we'll move into my new future plans um, for what I wanna do next. There's only a couple of them, but I'll be right back. <laughs> so uh, I have made one sewn object in the past little while and that are though, ooh, that is these pants. Um, these are the Bisque Trousers by Vivian Shaw. Um, they're a really lovely elastic waist, so nice and stretchy. Uh, trouser, pleated trouser pant, uh, so it's got quite a deep pleat in the front and a really nice slanted pocket. And so I did these in this kind of light green plaid color way. Um, that I just thought was kind of fun and I also have a wool that I'm planning on making a set in so I thought this would be a good trial to make sure that I'm getting my sizing right and everything like that and I'll put a video in of what they look like on uh I've been really liking them lately they're essentially like secret pajamas except because they're in flannel they're essentially just pajama pants, but I've been wearing them out and about and I'm really happy with them. It's a really smart construction, especially for the pocket. Um, I've never done a slant pocket. I've actually, I've only made one pair of pants before, so I've never done a slant pocket like this before. And it was really straightforward and I felt like I knew what was going on for most of the pattern, which is really what you want <laughs> while you're making things. Anyways, uh, sewing finished object, really excited about it. For my future plans in knitting, I have three, we'll say. So the first one is I'm gonna make another Oslo hat for my partner's dad, and his is gonna be in this gray color. It is Cascade 2020 fingering weight, um, non superwash, I believe, I think, uh, and just nice and squishy, pretty solid. It's gonna be a real workout horse of a hat, I think, because it's just such a great neutral. And the Oslo hat is just, it's like the perfect basic hat in my humble opinion. Um, I also got for Christmas, New Year's, <clears throat> this stash merino bling sock. Um, so this was made, I think, by Gathering Yarns for Stash, which is my, local yarn store that I go to a lot. Um, and it's superwash, merino, uh, nylon, and 2% Stellina. And so it's kind of glittery, <laughs> uh, which is really fun. So my plan for that is to make an all of the frills sock by Summerly Knits. I have her shorty sock pattern set, and that's one of the patterns in there. And it 
I think is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and hopefully I can wear them with like a pair of like nice-ish, nice-ish shoes um, for a Christmas party or a New Year's party or something like that. If those are happening this year, that would be really exciting. And, oh, oh boy, everything has fallen on the floor. I will be right back. Hey, welcome back. I am back off of the floor. Uh, and this is my next sweater project. So I honestly really liked making this sweater and I liked the color work portion a lot. What I would I think have liked even more is something that had more of a repetitive color work pattern. So because these flames are supposed to look kind of like organic and random, that means that you are not repeating the same set of stitches a lot of times in a row. So I, like I'm sure everyone else, has seen the Anne Ventsil on Instagram spot sweater. She also has like a classic crosses sweater. And those were the two patterns that I've been looking at for a long time and thinking, oh, those look really, really cool. And I don't feel like I'm quite ready for them yet. But I've decided that I may not be ready for them, but I'm gonna try them anyways. And if they go well, that would be awesome. Um, so I have this Patagonia or, um, organic merino from Jupiter, Ju ooh, Juniper Moon, <laughs> Juniper Moon Farm. Um, it's organic merino wool, 100% uh, wool and just nice and squishy. And I'm pretty excited about it. I got it in the color light gray. And then also in this orangey color, it's called rust, so really orangey. And so I'm gonna use these together. This is all of my sweater. There we go. So I'm going to use the gray as the background and then I'm going to use the orange to make the little kind of triangle motif that you see on the sweater. And so I'm really excited to try that out. I got the pattern and read through it before I bought the yarn for it to make sure that I felt like all of the techniques in there were things that I would be capable of doing and I think that with the help of some nice solid YouTube tutorials I'm gonna have a really fun time with it and hopefully uh, once I finish my hats this is gonna be the next cast on hats and socks once I finish those I'm gonna move on to this but I will not let myself cast this on until I am done my hats and socks so there's my rule for myself and I've said it out loud to the world so now it has to happen I have one more uh, future plan for sewing that I'm gonna show you right now because I have the fabric nearby and it's just so beautiful. So I placed an order recently from Blackbird Fabrics, which is a fabric store in Vancouver. Uh, they have such amazing textiles for clothing. If you are a garment sewist, I highly, 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 highly recommend looking at what they've got. Um, every time they do a new drop, I'm like, I've got to hold myself back because there is no way that I can get something from every single one. But they recently brought out a collection of flannels. And so this is one of their plaid cotton fl flannel, ooh, plaid cotton flannels in a ocean and orange and beige colorway. And I'm going to use this to make the Elb Connell shirt, I believe, um, for my partner. So it's going to be a lot of pattern matching. Uh, when you're sewing, it's not essential, obviously, by any means. Um, and I did not pattern match the plaid on my last pair of pants, despite attempting to do so. It did not end up quite even. But for this one, I'm going to really try and make sure that all of the lines are lining up at the seams. So at the very least, front to back, I want those lines to be at the same spot. So I've made one of them before. I made it for myself in a mystery fabric that I got at a thrift store, and I have not put the buttons on because I got nervous. So I also need to put the buttons on that one, and then maybe we can both wear our Connell shirts together. And you know, that basically covers my current works in progress and immediate future plans. Um, I am really, really excited for them, especially my sweater and the hats. I think that 
his parents are going to really appreciate the hats um, because they're made with love, <laughs> you know? So I would love to hear what you've been working on lately um, and what you've been doing while you've been knitting. If you've, I don't know, listened to any good books, watched any good TV shows, let me know in the comments. Let me know what you're working on. And that's basically all I've got on this front. Hey everyone, it's uh, Thal from the future here, briefly interrupting because I realized that I forgot to do the podcast shoutouts that I meant to do at the end of this episode as I was in the editing process. Uh, one of the comments on my last video was asking if there were any other beginning of the knitting journey uh, podcasts out there that I might know because they found it interesting to see the progression and I totally agree and I do have a couple of recommendations if that's something that you're interested in um, and some are more like beginner beginner people who are just starting out some are people who have been knitting for about a year or so now and I think that especially with a craft like knitting where the basic skills that you're using are quite similar between projects you can actually progress really dramatically over the course of just a year or so um, so I would consider some of them more of an intermediate level, but definitely people who are trying new things pretty frequently and doing things that they've never done before. Uh, so the first one that I would really highly recommend is Wooly, Richcraft, Wooly Witchcraft. Uh, Brogan is really, really sweet. And I've talked about her before in my first episode. She was the one who actually inspired me to start a podcast and start trying things that were a little bit harder in terms of knitting because I saw that she'd been talking about how she'd only been knitting for a year or so and she was already making such incredible sweaters and socks and all of this stuff. Uh, another person who started knitting over the course of the pandemic, uh, Kat Kelly Crafts. Uh, she also recently started knitting and has also made a ton of progress. Um, and it's really interesting to see the kinds of crafts and projects that she's picking up. I really love, she's made some socks lately that have just been really, really beautiful uh, color schemes. If you're looking for people who are like really just starting out and you want to see their whole progress from the beginning, uh, The Artisan Geek started a knitting podcast and they do videos about books and anime. Um, they have a ton of subscribers, I think more from the literary side of YouTube, but they've also recently started a knitting podcast uh, and it's their projects right from the very beginning also. And another super beginner knitting podcast uh, is Olivia Carter, and I'll link to all of these people down in the box below, but she's from Toronto and she's also been trying a bunch of new things like her first ever pairs of mittens um, and first ever projects overall. So that's been really fun to watch along with also. Um, Honestly, I love watching people of all different skill levels, but sometimes it is reassuring to see people who are also trying things for the first time and aren't complete experts. Uh, although maybe next time I'll do some of my favorite kind of older knitting podcasts of people who've been knitting for a really long time. Anyways, back to past Thal, and I hope you all have a great week. Maybe tell you a little bit about the trip that we took up to Jasper. Um, so Jasper is north of Calgary um, by four and a half, five hours. And you drive there along a road called the Icefields Parkway. Um, and it's called that because it passes through an area called the Columbia Icefields. And it's just glaciers. I, there are so many glaciers uh, in between here and Jasper and it's, just the biggest, rockiest mountains in the Rocky Mountains, it feels like. And really, really, really interesting. So we uh, stayed for a night in Banff with my parents. My dad had never been there before. So it was fun to kind of show him around the places that are nearby to us. And we got to walk around the town, walk down to the rivers and look through all of the kind of nature nearby not all of the nature that would take a lifetime uh, and then we drove up to Jasper for a night we went to a place called Malign Lake it had gotten a foot of snow and on the road in between Jasper and the lake there were at least 10 moose 
Moose's niece, kind of niece. Um, they, I think with the salt on the road, they're kind of like horses where they like salt. Um, and so they'd be kind of near the side of the road and some of them just like fully licking the street. Um, but people were obviously quite excited and slowing down a lot to try and look at the moose, um, which is understandable, but does not feel advisable because these are huge animals. They're so tall. Like we have a pickup truck that we were driving and the moose was eye to eye with us sitting in a like six foot tall pickup truck so that's a big animal and some people are getting out of the cars and that is not a good idea do not do that if you ever see a moose stay in the car and also keep driving <laughs> um but it was really really cool and i'll show i've got a little video of some of them at the end that i'll put in and yeah, it was the first major snow of the year, so the roads were a little bit slippery on the way back, um, and there was a car accident, but everyone was safe, which is really what's important. And we made it back to the city in plenty of time to have a little snack and head to bed. And then that was over Canadian Thanksgiving. So in Canada, Thanksgiving happens in the middle of October, and so that's pre-Halloween, so after Halloween you can be in full-on Christmas mode if you're ready for it. Um, but we, yeah, spent a lovely Thanksgiving with my family and I was really thankful that they were able to come out and visit. And then we got to show them around Calgary before they headed back to Ontario. Uh, and now we're just had a nice Halloween. Um, and then we're getting ready for Christmas next. Uh, we're just trying to slowly convince everyone that we love that they should come and visit Calgary in the winter because it is really, really beautiful here. Yeah. I hope that you all have a lovely week, that you get to spend some time with the people that you love and that your knitting is having happy days. Uh, bye for now.